Welcome to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. I am Dr. John, the guide for your heroic journey towards greater health, success, and most importantly, happiness. And now, on with the show. Hey everybody, this is Dr. John back with the latest episode of the Evolved Caveman. And today I am psyched to have with me Charles Matthews, who recently wrote Leadership and Masculinity, Embracing New Strength. And Charles has 35 years experience as an educator, wilderness guide, and team leader. He's led trips to the depths of the Grand Canyon and to the tallest point in Wyoming. He has taught thousands of teens and adults in effective communication, overcoming challenges, and compassionate leadership. Then he took that experience into the workplace, where he excelled in building strong, empowered teams. Charles is also proud of his work promoting healthy masculinity. Through his podcasts, mentoring, and workshops, Charles is one of the leaders of the national conversation, encouraging men to make the leap and drop the rigid definitions and destructive domination tactics to live a free and full life. Charles, welcome. How are you? Let me unmute. Let me have my voice be heard. Right. Um, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing great this morning. Uh, Dr. John, we've been, you know, you were talking a little bit about all the, all the great stuff I get to do today, which includes taking care of myself. I said, I got, got blood drawn so I could go meet with my doctor in a little bit. I'm taking the cat to the vet in a little bit. So I'm doing some nurturing and then I'm meeting with a friend for a beer this afternoon and keeping my relationship awesome intact. So I'm, I'm doing my best to live, uh, live outside of the man box and to, and to take care of myself and take care of others and to, and the nurture relationships. I, I actually saw your cat on the interview you were doing with Dr. Judy Chu from Stanford. And you were like, uh, yeah, this is, you know, recording at home. This is Yep. Is, uh, pandemic living. Yep. So let me let's let's jump off there because I was really enamored with that conversation that you had with Judy about sort of how this man box develops, what age it develops, and how do those dynamics begin? Yeah, and this is a little bit of me telling Judy's story, who of course is telling stories of little kids. But so Judy Chu, like you said, is a researcher from Stanford and um, has been studying gender for, you know, decades. And, you know, just to start off, we just have to hope that everybody in the audience is willing to accept this idea that gender and biological sex are not the same thing. And that gender is, is very frankly, something that gets created for us and that we sort of choose a little bit, right? So Judy's work shows how that choosing of what kind of person to be happens at a very young age, what kind of boy to be. Her book is called When Boys Become Boys. So it's not when boys become men, but it's about when boys become boys. Um, And she started interviewing and having long conversations with four and five-year-olds because initially she was talking to teenagers. Like, what is it? How How do teenage boys become sort of how do they choose their masculinity? How does, how does masculinity show up for them? How do they choose how to be with their friends? And the teenagers kept saying, you got to go back earlier. This mm-hmm. It already happened. We already made our choices. So the story that really stuck out for me when we interviewed her, uh, Mark Green and I interviewed her for the Remaking Manhood podcast a year or so ago, she was telling a story about a, a little boy at the age of four or five, trying to decide whether or not to join the mean team, the mean boys. And these were boys who were sort of setting themselves in opposition to the girls. They had a bunch of really strict rules that kept you either in the mean team or out of the mean team. And they weren't necessarily being mean. They were just being little boys. They were just being little kids. Um, But they called themselves the mean team because the girls were the nice team. So they were setting themselves up. They were creating their gender identity in opposition. Uh, I don't know if it's opposition, but as a, as a counter to what the girls were. We are boys. Those are girls. Girls are nice. We must be therefore mean. So this well, little- I think this, the insert in there is we are not, we are not girls. It, it's that yes. negative identity for the man right. box masculinity, which fascinates me. Right. It doesn't very- tell us what to be. It tells us what not to be. 
Right. And, and very early on, boys are realizing that girls are getting the short end of the stick. So it's better to be a boy. And how do we make sure that we're a boy by not being a girl, by not being uh, weak, by not being different. And the boys who couldn't join the mean team were the ones who were what we would call today, like neurodivergent. Um, maybe they were a little uh, softer, a little bit more interested in relationships. Those boys weren't really able to join the mean team. Um, so this, the story is this little boy is like talking to, talking to Judy about like, yeah, I can join the mean team, but I know that that means I won't be able to have, I won't be able to be friends with Sally or Juanita anymore. I won't be able to hang out with that, you know, that weird little kid. I'll have to be like that. And he's making these conscious choices. And so that really to kind of blow that up and make it bigger. It's like, I think, all of us men over and over again, make a choice about how, what kind of masculinity to show up in. And a lot of the times we make a choice that helps us create more belonging for ourselves with essentially the mean team, with the regular straight white cis guys that gets us belonging and that gets us safety. If we choose outside of that, we are choosing a lower status way to be. If we believe that it's always a competition, that it's always win-lose, that it's always power over, then any choice outside of the standard masculine boys club, tech bro, whatever you want to call it, culture, grind and, you know, rise and grind culture, whatever it is, when we choose outside of that, we're choosing less safety and a little bit less belonging. Now, what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and to go back to your original point, I think, let me just clarify for the listeners. So there's a difference between biological sex, which exists on a spectrum from male to female and everything in between and gender, which is on the spectrum of masculine to feminine and everything in between. And so we can have um, a masculine female, we can have a feminine male and everything in between. Yeah. But, but I think the point of that is that, Gender is, for the most part, socially constructed. Yeah, and and I, I think the biggest argument I've heard to this is those kind of island cultures or remote cultures where there isn't just masculine feminine; it's a tri tripartite model of masculine mm -hmm. of gender, and so they have sort of this in between gender, which is incorporates both the masculine and the feminine. Um, and, and I can't pronounce. I think it's Mayhew, which is kind of in the middle. Um, and, and so, and it, it, it's fascinating to me that the, the man box culture seems to crop up in nations where natural resources are scarce and we've got a bordering country, which could come in and take our resources. So we have to develop young men in the mold of kind of brave soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think that's one explanation and you know and that's you know and there's of course this myth that biology that there's binaries in biology and, and you already said there isn't really a binary in in biological sex either i know a lot of people object to that you got to really go look at the science you really got to go see that yeah. that that even biological sex is is on a spectrum and i really think that in the 21st century we are smart enough now and we are compassionate enough now to, with a little effort, make it possible for everybody to have their own gender expression. And even if it's, even if you say, you know, I consider myself, uh, I consider myself masculine in my own, I have my own masculinity and my masculinity includes like really being attached to my cats. Like, man, you know, the, President Obama talked about how when he became a parent, his, it was like his heart was on the outside of his chest. It's like, my heart is on the outside of my chest around my cats. I can barely stand taking them to the vet, even just for a checkup. Like, my heart is just outside of me. I can't, can barely stand it. So, my masculinity includes that. It includes... Um, you know, playing guitar, it includes drinking red wine. It includes, I was wearing a skirt yesterday because I really needed some, some comfort I love my that. waist. Yeah. Yeah. I was interviewing Judy too, wearing a skirt. Um, you know, it involves rock climbing. It involves uh, digging in the garden. It includes all of these things that are authentic to me. And the more authentic my expression can be, the more power I have. So this is, this is my counter to the story that that little kid 
was telling himself that he had a binary choice between being authentic or being safe and having belonging. What I'm saying to to men in particular now is that uh, find spaces, create spaces where you can be more authentic and whole in your expression of your masculinity, of your leadership. Pick and choose from the menu so that you're not wasting energy in suppression and repression of your own self so that you're not then, and what happens a lot is that when we suppress parts of ourselves, we then project that suppression onto others. We police, men police each other, men police women into the binary gender expression. We're not wasting well, energy some, doing that. We've got so much more energy to spend on our projects, our yeah. family, our health, you know, our, our hopes for the world. That's what I'm, that's what I'm talking and, about. And I've even had some, well, male clients tell me that women were policing them. You know, like a, mm-hmm. a teenage client was said, you know, I was sharing something deep with my girlfriend and I started crying and she was like, dude, stop being such a pussy. Yeah. And, and that's what it looks like to police, right? It's, it's yeah. all the insults, gay, fag, pussy, bitch, little girl. Um, it's all the classics that have been around since we've been kids. And for those, I, I don't mean to offend those with the insults, but I, I really think it's important to talk about them yeah. so that we know what we're talking about. So do me a favor. You <clears throat> did some interesting work um, working with boys and teens in the juvenile justice system. So yeah. let's make a, a jump from preschool, kindergarten to a little bit older. What did you learn there? Yeah. So I was helping run the boys to men mentoring program here in, here in my town of Prescott, Arizona. And we did rites of passage weekends and we did school mentoring circles um, with a really high adult to kid ratio and always doing group mentoring. And I had the the honor and, and privilege and, uh, sacred, difficult task of working, sitting in a circle every week with boys who are in the drug treatment program in the juvenile justice center. And what showed up over and over again, you know, I don't really, but one of the, one of the things it did is it caused me to throw out all of my ideas around the, the linear nature of development or any kind of like stages of development. And it caused me to throw out even some of my, some of the, my ideas around how predetermined we are by our traumas or by our experiences. Um, Because these kids were, you know, 16 people living in a single wide trailer, uh, you know, no idea who dad is mom in and out of jail or in and out of drug treatment, you know, uncles actually actively getting them into dealing drugs because that's what was kind of economically possible for them. Um, But when we sat in circles with these kids, so long as we showed up every week and so long as we listened without judgment, um, what showed up was their hearts and their desires and their brotherhood for one another and their interest in their own lives, um, we would, you know, start off each kind of section with, you know, what do you envision for yourself five or 10 years down the road? And all of them could tell some sort of, um, some sort of story about what they want to see for themselves. And it almost always involved security of a nice house, um, some sort of job, an awesome girlfriend, um, and a dog. They all wanted a dog. They wanted to take care of something else. They wanted some unconditional love back. Whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. Hold. No, no cats. Uh, very rarely cats. Very rarely cats. Okay. Yeah, that, was, that, <laughs> was their, that was their version of masculinity. I know I'm out. I'm outside the mailbox <clears throat> yeah. with my love for cats. I know every once in a while, a kid would say, I want to be, um, I want to be in the cartel or I want to be, um, you know, running drugs or whatever. And, you know, I talk about in, in my uh, TEDx talk, I think my first TEDx talk about what it was like for me when a kid said, I want to be, you know, a, a lieutenant for the Mexican cartels and how that, you know, it's like my head lit up on fire. I'm like, no, I don't want that for this kid. This isn't what's right. But by sticking around for several weeks and kind of asking him over and over again, it was like, A, it became clear that that was the only way he thought he could take care of his mama was by making yep. money that way. and. You know, with a little more time, it was like, no, I want to, I want to get my electrician's license 
and make a bunch of money that we're like, yeah, that's great. That's great. So, you know, young men get stuck into, in especially young incarcerated men or young men in drug treatment. We assume that they've become hardened, that they uh, are completely bought into this top down power over win, lose repression kind of way of being masculine but all it takes is and changing the environment that they're in, even for just an hour a week. And we find out that they haven't given up all their relational abilities. They would start mentoring one another. They would start giving one another advice. They would start telling one another that they loved them and that they believed in them. I believe in you, Carlos. I believe in you, Manuel. You don't have to go that way. Um, uh, you know, some of them had children at the age of 16. Some of them were, were parents and they were offering parenting advice to one another uh, across the circle. So those relational abilities, even though we might be giving them up at the age of four and five in order to be on the mean team, they're always there. And that's what I believe about all men, that those relational abilities are never completely gone. That ability to connect, that ability to nurture, that ability to lead from from vulnerability, from curiosity, it's always just under the surface. Well, and I think that ability to feel too. I mean, I remember yeah. when I was you know, 12, I used to think I was the only male that felt things deeply. And that was not how I wanted to be. And you know, I've worked with men for almost three decades now and come to find out probably 95 to 97% of them are exactly the same way. We're just, you know, we put the mask on and we're trying to hide it. But right. you give them a place where that can come out and not be judged. And it's a complete game changer. Yeah. So you get to see them, you get to see them one-on-one -on -one in your, in your treatment yeah. room and you get to, you get to hear what's underneath the, the mask. Right. And Ashanti yeah, Brown, treatment room. That sounds very scary. You okay. know, like what do you I got electrodes and nipple yeah. clamps and uh, just a room. <laughs> yeah, just it's not a, it's or not a Zoom. dungeon. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, Ashanti Branch. Is, Ashanti Branch yeah. talks about the mask, and he talks about the mask, yep. you, and the the movie, the mask you live in, talks about you know really clearly how many young men and men are even are even actually really conscious of like, here's yeah. the mask I wear when I'm at school. Here's the mask I wear out on the street, and what's behind the mask. He does that exercise where you like write on one side of the mask, how, what you show the world. I got to do this exercise. You got to facilitate this exercise when yeah. I was uh, a part of the group. And on the other side of the mask is what's really underneath. And, you know, it's like fear, insecurity, sadness, sadness insecurity, yeah. love, you know, all of these, it's the same stuff. It's the same stuff, whether it's um, a Hispanic kid from, from Oakland or a, a white executive in Cleveland. It's all the same stuff. Well, and, and that's why I love that level of emotion, because I think at that level, we're all, if not exactly the same, really, really similar, because we all feel the same emotions. And so I can connect with anyone on the emotional level. Now, we may lead completely different lives, but I can connect, I can empathize on that level. Absolutely. The other thing that was interesting to me, so I, I was interviewing Ashanti, I don't know, a year ago, and he grew up in Oakland and he was telling me that it wasn't cool. It wasn't in the man box to be smart when he was growing up. And, and I think that's, I think that might differ, but um, it, it was interesting just in that he was telling me that he had to hide his intelligence and his grades because that just wouldn't, it would get him kicked off the meme team. Yeah. Yeah. So to speak. And then he wouldn't be safe and he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have belonging. And, right. It's, it's really a terrible decision that we make authenticity versus safety and belonging. I mean, that's, that's a big decision and th there's no great answer there. Right. Right. And that's, you know, that's why I'm really focusing on, on working with leaders and male leaders because male leaders can have a huge impact on creating a safe place for everybody to be more authentic. So that they're, again, not wasting their time on repression and are actually able to show up to, to work on a creative team and a brainstorming session, you know, whatever it is with their with more authenticity and more power, more shared power. And you talked about, you know, emotions being the way we can connect with just about anybody. And this is what we noticed in our work with the teen boys and, and with men in the Mankind Project. Like when you are standing across when I was standing across from 
uh, a Native American kid, you know, 14 years old from the reservation uh, with all of these, all of these, uh, you know, pre-existing traumas, you'd think that there would be no way to connect. But when he says, I'm sad, or when I'm sitting in a circle and I'm, you know, showing up as a vulnerable mentor, when I'm saying, you know what, I had a fight with my wife this morning, I'm feeling really sad about it, I totally botched it, I'm feeling some shame, and I'm, I got to go home and repair it after the circle. Like, they can connect with me. They don't know what being married is like. You know, they don't know what going home to a, a nice house is like, but they know what embarrassed, shamed, sad. They know all of that. And then when a kid says to me, I'm feeling joy because my uncle's coming home after, you know, being in a stint in prison. I've never had anybody come home from a stint in prison, but I know what joy and excitement is like. Yeah. And it's... Uh, hmm. Well, let's let's make the jump to kind of embracing new strength. And yeah. and what is your idea of new strength? Because in the old man box, strength was domination over. Right. And right. physical power, I would argue. Right. Um, and, and so what is your idea about this new strength? Right. And it and it comes, I started calling it strength because I started noticing that I started having all this cognitive dissonance because I all of the things that the man box told me were forbidden, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, all, all these behaviors that were forbidden, the stigmatized behaviors, all of these uh, being curious, being vulnerable, being emotionally expressive, listening, all of these things that I wasn't supposed to do and that these boys and men that I was working with weren't supposed to do. I noticed that when we allowed those to happen, I felt really powerful. I felt really strong. I felt badass when I could listen to a kid from the reservation or when I could listen to a man on a mankind project weekend telling me the story of his abuse or his divorce or his fear for his children, whatever it was, when I could stand in that maelstrom of emotional power, emotional charge, like a, like a boulder in a stream, I didn't feel weak. I didn't feel passive. I felt grounded and strong and present and and manly. I felt like an awesome dude. And mm -hmm. when I saw boys or men reveal uh, hurt or joy or whatever it was, I didn't see them get smaller. The more I saw them express their emotions and the deeper that they went and the more they stepped out of the man box into their own authenticity, I saw their shoulders get square. I saw their head get lifted up. I saw shining from their eyes, even sometimes through tears and snot and whatever else. I saw shining this um, confidence and presence. So I'm like, wait a minute. All the stuff that the man box is telling me is weak and forbidden. Mm -mm. No, that stuff's strong. That stuff's strength. So when I, I did a TED talk about, you know, the old, the bullets of old strength you know, win, lose, power over, repression and oppression. And the four gifts of what I call new strength, which are just kind of the opposites, win-win, right? If it actually feels strong mm -hmm. to create a win-win, you and I are creating a win-win right now, sharing our ideas, lifting each other up. Power with, you know, being able to, to delegate, being able to um, share ideas, being able to create opportunities for more more people, inclusive ways for people to be more powerful. Uh, inclusion and vulnerability are the four gifts of new strength. And being able to consciously start shifting from that old paradigm to a new paradigm, it can be difficult because we get policed back into it all the time. Mm -hmm. Women might police us, men definitely police <clears throat> us. We might get anxious about sharing power. We might get anxious about sharing abundance because we're told that it's a zero sum game, that there's only so much to go around. Uh, so it takes some faith and it takes some work and it takes asking for help and it takes um, finding other brothers like you, like, uh, like Mark Green, like all these folks that I work with. But again and again and again, when I show up vulnerable, I get support. When I show up curious, I find new ideas. When I listen, I build shared power. Um, when I uh, express real concern, I get new information about how to move forward. So all of those old lies about how to be a man, I think have been holding us back. And then of course we turn around and hold other people back because we want to maintain this teetering grip on power in this 
power over win lose paradigm. Well, part of what you're saying makes me think about positive and negative emotion. I know those are misnomers, but you know, positive emotion being awe, gratitude, joy, love, sure. excitement, and so on, sure. which we are socialized away from. I would argue because you'll get called names that represent homosexuality. Yeah. Um, and on the other side, if you do too much sadness, fear, depression, anxiety, you're going to be called all the negative words that indicate feminine uh, or female. Right. Um, and, you know, all the ones I mentioned earlier. Um, and it, so I, I think we're in this bind if we show too much on either side of the emotional spectrum. And it, it makes me think like, uh, capitalization comes to mind and capitalization is the skill of being genuinely enthusiastic, excited, and curious when uh, it could be a loved one or it could be a coworker has good news. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many men I've talked to over the years that are like, yeah, you know, people in my neighborhood, they don't want you to be successful. They get jealous and they will tear me down and try and keep me where they are. And, and that, I guess I know why, but it, it just fills me with such sadness. Yeah. Yeah. So any, I mean, like, what are your thoughts on sort of the emotional side of either, you know, the positive or the negative and sharing? Mm -hmm. I, the other thing that comes to mind is I remember I was doing a positive psychology class for therapists and psychologists, and I was trying to figure out how to start the class off. And I thought if we just do like the regular introductions, those don't connect you to people. Like, you know, if I tell you I'm Dr. John Schinner, or I got a PhD from Cal and I wrote a book and I like people are like, what an ass. <laughs> well, maybe not, maybe not that strong, but it, it doesn't connect you emotionally. Right. Whereas if I talk about, and, and this is what I did. I said, tell me a story of you at your lowest where you mm. overcome that challenge. So it's a story arc where it starts out low, kind of in the gutter, so to speak, and then you rise above it. Yeah. That story arc, I mean, you could feel the difference in a palpable way in the room. Like we were bonded to each other emotionally. And so it, it brings up this interesting idea to me of, you know, even with capitalization or, you know, pride or talking about abundance, I almost think that we need to lead with I don't know, our challenges or our shortcomings and any thoughts on that? Yeah, that reminds me, I mean, you know, just the, the story you just told reminds me of how I just kind of demonstrated how I would be vulnerable to a bunch of boys. Like, yeah, I had a misunderstanding with my wife this exactly. morning and I feel really bad, um, but I know that I, got, I can go home and clean it up because we've got really, my wife and I have really great communication skills and, and I'll get taken care of. We would never leave. We would be vulnerable, but we wouldn't leave our, our mentees on the hook. Like they don't have to take care of me. I'm going to go home yeah. and take care of it. So, yeah. So there's an arc to that. Um, and, you know, it's, I think one of the fears that men have, and I think actually one of the fears that capitalism and the workplace has around emotions is that, emotions are uncontrollable and are going to put us on some sort of roller coaster and we're never going to get things done. So I think sort of, you know, the Germanic uh, Anglo-Saxon approach toward uh, organization and capitalism and suppression of emotions in the public sphere is this fear of where emotions are going to take us. And, you know, that was 200 years ago, man. We're beyond that now. We don't have to be like that. We can integrate, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we can integrate emotions into the workplace and into the public sphere in a way that actually brings us power, right? So it's in a, in, in a relationship, in a marriage, if I suppress all of my, so I'm, I'm about to move cross country with my wife and her, and her mom and dad. I got okay. a lot of emotion. I got a lot of emotions coming up. Right. And if I suppress my anxiety about sharing space with another couple of people who have their own ideas about how to live, if I, if, if I suppress the joy, I feel about, we've actually got a bunch more resources now because we sold a house and we're going to move to a place that's cheaper. If I suppress my, uh, uh, my joy about that, it, it, it comes out sideways and I, and it, and it prevents actual connection with my wife. 
But when I can say, wow, I'm feeling some anxiety about how we're going to share these houses and share these resources, then we can come up with some solutions or not even, I don't even need a solution. I just need her to Mm -hmm. know. I just need her to know me. I need there to not be anything blocking our relationship. And in the work and in the workplace, it's the same thing. It's like, if I'm a boss and I'm saying, wow, I'm feeling a little concerned that I don't really understand how we're doing this product rollout. I feel a little anxious. Can we go through it one more time? I'm not bossing anybody around. I'm just coming from my authentic concern. Mm -hmm. And now my employees know me and they know that they can actually support me by going through the rollout one more time. I'm not nitpicking. I'm not micromanaging. I'm just coming from this place of concern. Oh, so that brings up another tangent. So you mentioned in a prior interview that you were not always a great leader. Micromanaging was kind of my tangent there. Tell a little bit about that journey of leadership discovery. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So <laughs> I, I, I've been fortunate enough when I started my career to be leading, you mentioned in the intro, leading in the outdoors, guiding people in the Grand Canyon, guiding people, kids and adults through the, through the woods and the mountains. And in that arena, I learned collaborative leadership because we always led in teams. Uh, I learned, you know, kind of whole human leadership because we were talking about the somatic, you know, talking about the body, mm. you know, what does it feel like to rock climb? We're talking about emotions and what is it? Oh, you're getting scared of the storm. You know, we, it was a whole spectrum of, of how we approached leadership. I learned to pivot really well. I learned to communicate really clearly. And then I, you know, got promoted into program management positions in that industry and eventually became program manager of boys to men. And then John, I got promoted again to executive leadership, right? And it's like, oh man, that's a whole different set of skills. All of my kind of imposter syndrome came up, all of my fears, anxieties about being uh, revealed to being a fraud, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I responded by kind of clamping down on my employees. And I did, I micromanaged. I was literally arguing with my program manager about his punctuation and capitalization in the reports that he was creating for the board. That was that was how I was trying to keep myself safe. Yeah. Right? Just like micromanaging this guy instead of mentoring him into his own greatness. Uh, I, you know, well, if I can interject a yeah. point there, I find that those needs to control others are often rooted in our own anxieties. Oh. And, and so if we can look at that, I think it's a great door, like it's an escape hatch. Yeah, exactly. You know, if we can, when we develop that kind of level of self-awareness you're talking about, like it's Mm -hmm. natural, it's going to keep coming up. My desire to micromanage, my desire to control is going to come up throughout my life. And And the imposter syndrome, everybody has that. Absolutely. And the more uh, I can do to reduce my reactivity through meditation, through breathing, through whatever, so that when those impulses come up, I can take that step off to one side and be like, oh, there you go again, Charles. Uh Uh-huh. You idiot. Um, uh-huh. and, then, and then make a difference. Oh my gosh, you have that thought too? <laughs> Actually, mine's much more inflammatory, but it ends in idiot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a UMF idiot or right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, when I got promoted, I, I made all these mistakes. Unfortunately, my board, you know, hooked me up with some transformational coaching. And to, to and I, we practiced meditation, we practiced breathing with the coach, did a bunch of what I would call soul work around imagining my own death and like, what do I want my legacy to be? I wrote, I wrote my own obituary from a bunch of different standpoints and that, and this is might be strange for people to hear, but imagining the end, imagining being dead is actually very calming for me. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, this is going to end at some point. No, I think it's, you know, gets back to Jung's, uh, quote about, you know, paradox being the closest we can get to truth and humanity, where uh, I like the idea that the more comfortable we can get with our own idea of death, the more fully we can embrace life. The more we're aware of, you know, the idea that divorce is a daily option, the more present we can be in our marriage. Paradox. Yeah. That's the one that scares me. That scares the bejesus out of me. Sorry. I don't mean to divorce. It's okay. No, it's good. this This is exactly, it's like, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, but it does. If I'm aware that breakup is a 
daily possibility, I'm going to work harder to date my fiance, mine's fiance, yeah. but to let her know how much I appreciate her, to let her know how valued she is, yeah. to support her, all those things. Thank you, John. As opposed uh, to taking her for granted. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's my learning yeah. from this podcast interview. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we're we're nine years into I think our nine year anniversary of our first date just went by and uh, congratulations thank you and I think we I take I don't exactly take it for granted but I said the other day to her I can't imagine getting divorced and it's I, hard and I, not and to need, take it for I granted need, and I need to I need to be able to manage that and, imagine and, that because I think we're we are um, we're fighting our own human tendencies there where. We we habituate, right? It's called the hedonic treadmill, where we just we take everything for granted unless we're actively working against it. Yeah. 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 So gratitude work is a way to work against that treadmill, right? It's like yep. we bought a we bought a espresso maker for each other four years ago. Uh-huh. And I just try and remind I try and remember as often as I can as I'm making my morning coffee, like, oh, look at what we have. Look at what we have. Yeah. But you know, that's a that's a little small thing, but you know, the, I think that's another, that's another, you talked about the, the positive emotions being um, policed out of us. Gratitude gets mm-hmm. policed out of us. Anything that's outside of this narrow uh, stoic range for men in particular and leaders, especially, uh, you know, anger, frustration, maybe are allowed, but yeah, if we bring joy into the workplace, oh my God, work is going to stop and everything's going to fall apart and it's just going to be a Saturnalia. There's going to be goats and and wild I mean, dancing here, and craziness. Yeah. Here's a, here's a list of positive emotions. Now think of which of these are acceptable in the man box. Gratitude, awe, wonder, relaxation, contentment, joy, love, curiosity, appreciation, courage. Okay, I'll take that. Pride, man, maybe. Self-compassion, compassion, hope, laughter, mm. peacefulness, inspiration, elevation. And then you, I mean, yeah. I would say maybe two of those are acceptable. Right. Right. And part of it, That's I think tragic comes from, to me, it is tragic. And it, and it means that we're a very narrow slice of humanity, right? We're, we're it means very, we're cut off from our own happiness. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we don't live as long. Um, uh, Johnson. What's his name? What's his first name? He wrote man and male and female. Robert Johnson, the, oh, the, Robert. the depth psychologist. Yeah, Robert. Robert Johnson yeah. wrote that that um, men can get stuck in a mood and that uh, a mood is kind of, you know, emotion gone sour. So when he gets stuck in a negative mood, like sadness and grief are perfectly acceptable important emotions. I think grief is one of the most important emotions to actually feel. But when we get stuck down there in depression or cynicism, we see a lot of men expressing their, their cynicism leaders are even supposed to supposed to express cynicism. Um, But on the other end, in that kind of positive emotion state, if we get stuck in that mood, we get sort of permanently elated and we get this kind of like spiritual bypass where, and we don't see it as much in the in the work world, but we see it a lot in this kind of the the spiritual or even kind of new age movement where men are just kind of like off in la la land. They're they're in Fiji. They're and we even see it in kind of like the inter, the uh, Instagram culture of like man, everything's uh-huh. good. It's all good, um, and it's not all good. Things need mm-hmm. some work. So either mood either the dark mood or the white mood, the, the shining light mood are not where we want to be stuck. We want to be, I want, and I, I, th- I think, I think men can do with just a little bit of work, find ways to let emotions show up, be observed, be examined for the messages that they're giving us and then let go of. Yeah. And that's why I talk about in, in my book, just keeping an emotions journal. And, and the, an emotions journal doesn't need to be a long diatribe of stories about that emotion. It's just it's like, what are you feeling right now at four o'clock in the afternoon? What are you feeling right now? Mad, sad, glad, well, scared, sighted, whatever. Yeah. It's interesting. There's a study that shows that that's one of the best things we can do to develop the essential skill of leadership, metacognition, but also emotional awareness to simply stop, to pause three times a day, let's say. Yeah. And ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? And here's the crazy thing is in the studies, it doesn't matter what the answer is. 
It doesn't even matter that there is an answer. It's just the act of pausing and going, huh, what am I feeling right now? Right, right. Yeah, that very meta, powerful that, that exercise. Metacognition is, that metacognition is so powerful, right? That ability to step aside and go, huh, why did I do that? Or, huh, why do I want to do this? Or why, what am I feeling right now? Or why am I getting triggered? And I think for men in particular, as we engage with inclusion and diversity, this is what I was talking about with Ed Gurowitz on, on uh, last week's interview. He was talking about men in particular need to downshift, do breathing exercises, whatever we can do to open up that a little crack between our stimulus and reaction so that we have some freedom. So when a woman says uh, on Twitter, you know, I'm so tired of being harassed in the workplace, you'll see, you see it on Twitter, right? Uh, men will respond with not all men. Not all men do that. And that's true. Not all men harass women in the workplace. Now take a moment and breathe and receive the information that we're getting from women, from people of color, from LGBTQI folks, from people yeah. from the global south, from whatever, just to receive that information. Oh, women are frustrated at this workplace. I'm getting called out as a member of the group of men, the tribe of men. I'm getting called out. Maybe I didn't harass anybody. Maybe I did. Maybe I unintentionally. And didn't know it even. And didn't know it. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I have been sexist in my recruiting promotion policies. Maybe I have. I don't know. I, I think that's a, that's a big possibility because uh, Tasha Yurik has you know, research where she shows that 95% of the general population will self-report that we are highly self-aware when in fact it's about 10 to 15%. I really think that we are creatures of habit. We are quite unaware and that we really have very little idea of what our values are, what our thoughts are, what our feelings are, and what our behaviors are. That is a seriously depressing statistic. Sorry. No, it's, I mean, it's, we need to, <laughs> yeah. And, and it brings us really important information, right? It's like, okay, if only yeah. 15% of us are, are self-aware, am, aware. I one of, am I one of those 15%? How can I help other people? And I think one of the ways that those of us who maybe have some self-awareness and maybe have, you know, done enough breathing exercises or meditation to pause, if somebody else comes at me with a reaction, can I help that person be more self-aware by saying, wow, yeah. that, you, that sounds like there's some really strong energy or anger behind what you just said. Can you help it, me understand that? Instead of being like, whoa, dude, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. Well, and this gets back to the idea of non-defensiveness. Um, but, you know, going back to the mood that you brought up a while back. So I look at mood and emotion as two different affective phenomenon. So mm. emotion has a cause. Emotions generally last a couple minutes. They're supposed to, although we hold on to anger a little bit longer than we need to. Um, so they have a cause and they're short-lived. Mood in general is, I think of as emotion stretched thin over time and longer in duration. And it doesn't necessarily have a cause, which is a, a big deal if you're trying to deal with your own, let's say, depressed mood. Um, but I think for men, the two moods that I see bringing men in to see me most often are irritability, which is actually depression underneath the hood, and anxiety, which I would argue is a result of often a result of us just suppressing a lifetime of emotions mm -hmm. and saying, I don't feel that. Yeah. But Jed Diamond's done some amazing work on male depression and how it looked like his list of symptoms, almost everyone has an anger component to it. If you think of anger, you know, on a spectrum, right, with irritation, frustration, annoyance, you know. Yep. Yeah, that's what we would tell parents uh, about their about their boys. We tried to we tried to really when we were mentoring boys, we tried to really take the side of the kid. Um, but, you know, a lot of as single moms, especially we're dealing with these boys who are. Uh, he's slamming doors. He's punching holes in the walls. And, you know, he speaks to me really disrespectfully and like, okay, how do I help this mother understand that her son is depressed and sad about the divorce, about their living situation, about whatever? Because it doesn't, it doesn't look like depression. 
Mm-mm. It's you, know, you got you got holes in your in the walls of your manufactured home because your now teenage son is finding out he's got a lot of strength in his in his uh, triceps and and shoulders, and it's his way of yeah. coping with this with this suppressed emotion. And it shows up in men, right? You know, the, one of the phrase we haven't used this phrase yet uh, today, and I'm I'm kind of glad we have it, but I'm going to bring it up because um, oh, I mean, just people are talking about what they call toxic masculinity. Oh and, yeah. I don't like that. Phrase. I don't use that phrase, but this is, I don't either, but it, but it gets, it gets called out for being toxic. One of the reasons is because when we are, if we're sad or in grief or disconnected or feeling ineffective, we show up, we tend to show up with anger, as you point out. Mm-hmm. Um, and anger, as you also point out, is hard to let go of and it creates ripples, right? When we get angry around other people, they get scared. So instead of creating opportunities for connection, we fracture connection, not intentionally, maybe. Um, and so we create a, you know, a ripple event of a not safe place, whether it's in our relationships, in our parenting, in our leadership, uh, in our partnership with others. That anger, unfortunately, creates more problems around us in, in ever widening ripples. Well, and it, but I think it, it works as a short-term strategy because often if you're angry at work, let's say you can get what you want, but it, you're absolutely right. It does, it fractures connection and as a long-term strategy, it's terrible. But I think we often, I've seen it over and over that a lot of men learn that they can get what they want by anger. Right. And that's the only strategy they have. Right. And, and I think to me, anger is the biggest, the most dominant, you know, it, when I was uh, consulting for Inside Out, they looked at the neuropsych research and showed that there's a signature emotion for each of us, right? Sadness, anger, fear, contentment. And to me, most of the men that I work with, anger is their signature emotion, their go-to mm-hmm. emotion, the one they're most familiar with, most comfortable with, and the one that they have the least control over. Yeah. Yeah. And it can feel powerful, right? It like it physically feels oh, powerful. Yeah. Your amygdala gets tripped, your adrenal glands get tripped, you you get flushed, you actually you physically have more glucose in your muscles. You are actually physically stronger. And as you say, you can kind of get what you want in the short term. You can get people to leave you alone, or you can uh spur your team into getting you that report that you wanted yesterday, right? Yeah. You can you can get your partner to uh you know accede to your demands or whatever. But in the long term, it is actually a really weak strategy. It is that's a terrible. weak, weak strategy. Well, and the other thing that's I, I think the most damning about that anger dynamic is if you and I are in a disagreement and I'm getting angry. I am externalizing all blame onto you. So if you would just stop doing X, I wouldn't be so mad. And the problem with that is it completely cuts off accountability. It completely cuts off personal growth. And that's a big problem. Right. Cuts off personal growth. Yeah. Right. Is that what you want? Is that what you want? Do you want your personal growth shut off? And and to a certain extent, the man box says yes. Right. The man box says, Mm -hmm. I am what I am. Don't ask me to grow. Don't ask me to evolve. You know, don't ask me to be different than I am. I am what I am. Don't challenge me. And that's a, sounds that's like a, the Popeye theme. Exactly. Exactly. He's, he's the quintessential man's man, right? From the, yeah. from the 30s and 40s. Um, Charles, and, you're and, aging me. And apparently a vegetarian. Um, <laughs> right? Get that spinach. So, but what do we really but, want? What do we really want as men? Right. What do we really want? Do we really want people to snap to? Do we really want to age our own bodies with cortisol and adrenaline? You know, do we do we really want our children to be afraid of us? Um, Do we really want our employees to, you know, I I know someone who today is going to HR as part of their their exit interview and they are going to lay a steaming heap of crap on the desk of HR about their supervisor. Is that what you want? Or do you want to be able to, so, you know, using anger, for example, you know, it's, um, I, when I am able to have that third person perspective on my own emotions and say to, you know, my team feeling really anxious and a little bit angry right now that we didn't 
meet our goal like we said we were going to. That makes me feel scared. Um, I'm worried about what the board is thinking. I'm not in a position right now to do any problem solving. I just want you to know I'm feeling really anxious and frustrated and angry. And in two days, two days from now, I want to have a get together about what we can do to fix this going forward. And see, that's a great use of anger. I mean, to be able to speak to it calmly, to label it, to be aware of it, that's fine. I think most men don't understand the difference between emotion and action. Mm -hmm. Because it's, you know, it happens in a third of a second. And so we get angry, we punch the wall. Yep. And, and so we don't, it, it takes some practice, I think, to become aware of it. As you said, take a breath and extend the gap between stimulus and response and to work at separating those two. And so you can speak to, yeah, I'm getting a little bit frustrated here yeah. versus, you know, being used by your anger, so to speak. Um, and, and I think the other thing that's important to point out, I'm... I, Anger exists for a reason. So anger isn't all bad. And I think anger can be used to fuel, you know, social movements. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and I think that can be appropriate and useful. But I, I think too often I see anger um, just in charge of us rather than right. us in charge of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, we sometimes we use it to control others. Sometimes we use it to, to create this environment of fear, make it clear if, if I'm angry and I'm able to express it, that must mean I have some status over you. If you are angry and you can't express it, that must mean you have lower status in this organization, in this family, in this whatever. Um, so we get to anger is one way to police that status. Yeah. Um, but again, it's like, yeah. what do we, what do we really want? You know, do we want a partner, a life partner who's going to come to us when he or she is sad or needs something or one who's going to be afraid of triggering us? Do we want a team that's going to be willing to um, brainstorm really creative, sometimes ridiculous ideas, one of which is going to be a game changer for us? Or do we want them all looking at us like we're the silverback gorilla and they have to follow our every move and every mood? And, and anything else is not safe. You know, what do we really want? And, and for men out there who are listening, like, you know, keep listening to the Evolve Caveman podcast. Keep listening to all these amazing research pieces that, that John is laying down about where emotions come from, how to work with them, how to shift them, how to take a breath. Well, because ultimately, to your point, I think one of the main goals in life is all about connection. Yeah. Connecting to other people. And, you know, Chris Peterson, who is past, but was at University of Michigan, one of the fathers of positive psychology, summed it up perfectly as other people matter. <laughs> and I don't think we realize the damage that we do with our own anger and the fractures that we create. I mean, like I like Dr. Faith Harper's definition of trauma, which is anything that disconnects you from a feeling of safety. Now, that's a really low bar for trauma, right? And, but if we think of, you know, a father getting angry at the wife or the kids or coworkers, that's a, a rupture from a feeling of safety. Yeah. And yeah. we can't learn when we don't feel safe. We can't experience half of the positive emotions when we don't feel safe. Right. And that's not just a woo woo statement you're making. The part of no. our brain that learns literally shuts down. That's that research. Yeah. 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 So again, you know, think about what is it you really want. And, and, you know, if you, if you're, you know, working with a coach or working with a therapist and, and can do some of that work, like, what do I really want? You know, when I did that eulogy work, that death work, that, that memorial work with my transformational coach, I got really clear about what I really wanted. I want my wife to be able to tell everybody he was always there for me. I want my work team to be able to say, he supported us. He took a stand for our needs. He took a stand for our growth, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I really connected with what I really wanted and then looked at my behavior, yeah. my micromanaging behavior and be like, oh, that's not going to get me what I want, is it? Well, it makes me think of the Maya Angelou quote of, and I, I am going to massacre this, but it's something about people won't remember everything you do, but people will always remember how you made them feel. Right. And, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think it's that quote is so 
tried and true that it's become kind of cliche, but I think it's cliche for the reason that it's speaks great truth. Yeah. Yeah. So Charles, I'm, I'm aware of time here and I, I got to say, this has been a really, really enjoyable conversation. I've just, this will fill me up for the next few days. So thank you for that. Yeah. And and I've, learned, I've learned so much. This has been fantastic. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that I should have? Oh, like give them the name of your book again and where they can find it. Yeah. So it's on Amazon. It's Leadership and Masculinity, Embracing New Strength. And actually, in case any of your listeners want to, they can go to charlesmatthews.com slash caveman. And that's C-H-A-R-L-E-S-M-A-T-H-E-U-S charlesmatthews.com slash caveman. And there's a special offer there. They can actually get a chapter of the book for free and kind of check it out and see if it, it matches with you and, and your needs. So charlesmatthews.com slash caveman. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Again, I, I really appreciate the time. I really appreciate the beginning of our relationship. Yes. Um, and, you know, let me know how I can support you down the road. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm, if you can get my wife and I free, uh, admission to your retreat down in Costa Rica, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will check into that. Thank you. Okay. Ask for what um, you want. <laughs> yeah, I like it. And that is it for this episode of the Evolved Caveman. If you love this episode, if you like it, please feel free to review, rate, share it with your friends. If you didn't like it, you don't have to do a damn thing. Thanks so much. Until next time. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 